On this edition of Talk to Al Jazeera, a country that rarely makes the international headlines. Named after the vast Namib Desert, Namibia is a place that's been controlled by two different foreign powers in the last century. Until World War I, it was a German colony, a period that was marked by repression and the genocide of thousands of tribesmen driven into the desert where they starved. Then Namibia's neighbor, South Africa, took control, imposing its apartheid system. It's now a post-colonial, post-conflict nation facing many of the same problems as its neighbors. So far, it's kept the domestic peace, and many things are going well. On the global index of corruption, for example, Namibia ranks lower than many others in Africa. And tourism is growing, although headlines about seals culled every year are a challenge. But in this country that is extremely rich in mineral resources, there is great inequality. Many of the big landowners here are white, the black population is now so angry about this, the president says the white population must give up land or possibly face a revolution. In the 22 years since independence, the country has been run by just one party, SWAPO. Its leader is President Hifikepunye Pohamba. I sat down with him to discuss how the country has managed to remain so peaceful and how he intends to deal with the underlying anger and discontent that's now growing. President Pohamba, the president of Namibia, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Can I start by asking you, what do you believe is the biggest challenge facing your country at the moment? Well, the biggest challenge is the economic growth. And these challenges are also accompanied by some progress that the country has made ever since we got independence. One of the things that you have, which is a good thing, I suppose, is a lot of rich natural resources. But for some other countries in Africa, that's actually been a curse. For example, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yes, indeed. Namibia is rich. We have minerals. We have fishing industries. We have many other things. But these are not benefiting as we wanted our people. Most of our resources are taken out in the raw form to other countries. And we are left with people who are suffering from poverty. Now, the other thing that we lacked so much at the independence the colonizer that is South Africa, apartheid South Africa, were apparently so clever. They denied the Namibian people education. For your information, the first university in the country was established two years after independence. So we have been faced with the challenges. We have no our own skilled people who can explore the resources that we have underground in the water. So a lot was done for us by some people from elsewhere. And these people, I think they did not do it better the way we wanted it. I accept your historical point, but your party, SWAPO, has been running Namibia now for 22 years, and still there is this inequality. As one Namibian I spoke to said, some 90% of the population have to share just 10% of the resources. Why haven't you done more to change that? You are right. You are right. You cannot do things within 20 years, especially when you have set the constitution that says those who were there owning the properties they should have them. Let's come to the question of land, for example. The land, uh, according to uh, what we have done, that those who own the land legally at that particular time, the land belongs to them. However, the government should appeal to those who have got the land to sell some of the land to the government 
so that the government will be able to distribute the land to the landless. Yes, indeed, the people, and when I say the people, I'm referring to the majority, who were enslaved within their own country, the land was taken away, first by the Germans when they colonized the Namibia, and then South Africa, when they came in, they continued taking the land from the black people. As a result, the black people felt that the land after independence should come back to the people. But again, as I said, we have a constitution that obliges us to run the country in accordance to the rule of law. Well, can and I ask you, sir, do you think that constitution should be changed? Is that constitution a hindrance? Uh, you know, I'm not quite clear which point you're making here. Do you want to remove the white farmers from this land? No, not exactly so. Like I said, the conference on the land suggested, in fact, passed a resolution that those who have a plenty of land, they should sell it to the government. And we tried to get the land from them. Unfortunately, there is reluctance. So you're going to try something else now? Something else maybe has to be tried. But you're not going to try anything like Zimbabwe, like Mr. Mugabe seizing the land I don't want because that, that destroyed their agricultural can, sector. Can we talk about Namibia other than Zimbabwe? But it's an interesting example of how things could go. Yes, we, we feel that uh, there should be amendment to the constitution so that it would allow the government to not forcing but to pressurize who have got the land through the mechanism of law so that they sell it to the government. We are not talking about confiscation. We are talking about them to sell the land to the government in order for the government to, to give the land, distribute the land to the, to the, I don't like to use the word black because black is something else, but to those who formerly been disadvantaged by the situation. I know you don't want to make it a race issue, but just directly appeal to those white, and they are predominantly white farmers now. What would you say to them? For the last 20 years, we have been appealing to them that, please, let's consider ourselves, irrespective of our color, as one people, as Namibians. And if a Namibian is suffering, let all sympathize with them. Here we have hundreds, if not thousands, of the Namibian people who have no land and therefore suffering because they have no means of production. Let's get the land to the government. By saying get the land, we are not saying it to confiscate, as I have said earlier, but to sell it to the government. The government has the land. We have the policy of a willing seller, willing buyer. That has not been working for the last 22 years. And I think something has to be done. Something has to be done to amend the Constitution so that the government is allowed to, uh, to buy the land for the people. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we would face a revolution. And if the revolution comes, the land will be taken over by the revolutionaries. You talk about a revolution. Do you yes. think the people are getting angry when we look at the mining certainly, sector? We look at, again, I'm sorry, I'm looking at another neighboring country, but we look at South Africa, we look at the problems they're having now, the Maracana mine. Do you see the inequality leading to this sort of problem inequality in your country? Inequality exists. And we, as people in the leadership, our appeal to those who have the land is falling in the death is. And the only thing that could be done is to amend some provisions of the Constitution that would allow. Yes, people are not happy. And when you talk about people not happy, what do you expect? They can react. And they, when they react, and this is where I talk about revolution, when they react, and they react, then those who have the land they will not have that land. The people will have to take over the land. And this is what we have been trying to prevent. 
the last 22 years. But as I said, unfortunately, our appeal is not being taken by those who have got the means of production in the country. You've talked a lot about the land and about agricultural resources. If I can ask you about other mineral resources, what is your policy on mining and other minerals? Do you think this should be done in the private se sector or do you think it should be done by the state? We, our constitution allows us to have a private sector, to have a public sector working together. Should there be more state control, though, so you can share more of the money? No, no, we are not talking about state control. We would like to see the Namibians taking a part as well. The, the, the private sector, the companies owned by the Namibians taking part, and those foreign companies who would wish to come and work together with the Namibians who are running businesses. We are encouraging the Namibians to take part in the businesses, not that the state, no, the state can also have some stake in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the economy of the country, but we are encouraging the private sector to do that, and we are encouraging the investors to come and work together with the Namibians so that they can exploit the resources. Mr. President, tell our viewers about Namibia's untapped resources. That country is rich. What we don't have maybe is oil. They were looking for it, weren't they, recently? They have been looking for oil. Unfortunately, the signs, they say they are signs, but we have not yet strike it. So we have gold, we have a diamond, we have uh, many other resources, copper, et cetera, et cetera. It's plenty. And we have fish. So in the agriculture, we have plenty of cattle. We have a plenty of games in our game reserves. Of course, another of your industries is encouraging people to come to Namibia is the tourist industry. Can you tell me what your policy is there and how you try to get more people to Namibia without spoiling the stunning natural beauty of your country? Again, we have the ministry that is responsible for implementing the policies of the government in tourism. And uh, I can tell you, we are one of the rich countries when it comes to tourism. We have, and I mentioned that earlier, a lot of games. And as you have said, Namibia is a small country. By the way, we are just a small in the population, but the size of the land is so big, more than 100, more than 800,000 uh, hectares. Uh, I mean, square, uh, square hectares. Uh, the country is big, and most of the country where there are no people is occupied by the games. So uh, we encourage the people to come to Namibia. We are doing everything possible, building the industry, I mean, the, the, the infrastructure in the areas where we feel that uh, tourism is potential. Building things without destroying the beauty, though. That is, that is the difficult balance, isn't it? No. We are very, very careful. We are very, very careful. Again, I take you to the Constitution. Our Constitution says we have to make sure that the natural environment of the country should be preserved. And we are doing that. Tell me, in terms of tourism, how many tourists would you like to see coming to your country in 10 years' time? Well, uh, already we are counting about 800,000 per annum. I think in 2010, and I speak under correction somehow, we have heard around about 800 tourists who visited Namibia. In five or ten years' time, I expected that we would have maybe a million and a half people visiting Namibia per annum. 
One thing that might upset some tourists, and I know it's been reported uh, quite a bit about this, is the seal hunt currently underway in Namibia, goes on until November. Some 80,000 seal pups are going to be killed. They're going to be hit with wooden sticks with spikes on the end. Can you please justify that? Before I come to the seals, Namibia is one of the countries in Southern Africa where we have a big livestock, and I'm referring to cattle and sheep. And uh, the cattle and sheep, they are used to benefit the people of Namibia. People don't talk about cattle and sheep. They talk about seals. They do. Seals, I'm asking you about seals, seals, seals. not about cattle well, and sheep. Well, so tell, tell me no, about no, the no, seals. No, no, no. I just want to tell you that seals are resources of Namibia that can be utilized to benefit the Namibian people. Like we utilize cattle, like we utilize sheep, like we utilize other uh, animals that we have. We, as I said, we have plenty of them. We have uh, kudus, we have uh, giraffes, we have uh, others. But you're not going around killing the giraffes. But, but we do kill, we do harvest. What we are talking about is harvesting. We harvest the cattle, we harvest the giraffe, we harvest the other animals that we have. But not and an organized cull like seals. this. We harvest the seals, we harvest the, sh the fish. And all these are natural resources of the country that are there to benefit the people. And I see no point why people have to talk about the seals all the time and leave it out to others. Well, some people say, and I know there's some environmental groups who say they've done the calculations, that actually you'd make more money keeping the seals alive and encouraging tourism, tourists to come and look at the seals and encouraging tourism around the seals than you do from killing the seals and then selling their pelts. No, 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 no. The point is that we talk about harvesting. And the harvesting is done carefully. It's not to finish up the seals. We go to the sea to harvest the fish. And when we see that there is a depletion of the fish, we stop and try the fish to multiply. And we go there to catch them. When we see that, now we have got the fish. The same applies to the seals. It doesn't mean that we are uh, um, harvesting the fish to finish them up. We are just harvesting them as the same we do with the fish, as the same we do with the other livestock that we have in the country. Changing subjects. Changing. Changing. <laughs> One area that seems to bedevil many African countries is the problem of corruption. In Namibia, you're not, you've not got the same levels of corruption as some other countries. Tell me, how bad is corruption in your country and how do you go about keeping <laughs> it under control? I don't think corruption is an African thing. No, not just African. Only. Not just African. Why you pick up Africa? I'm just saying in Africa, it is one of the problems. Yes, you find the corruption, we read the corruption in Europe, in many countries. I don't want to mention the countries, but I talk about Europe. You hear about corruption. Big people being corrupted, appearing before the courts. You see, the world has become a small village. The influence of Europe obviously has come to Africa. And I think most of the people who are said to be corrupt, they are corrupted by the people who come to Africa. They are the ones who made the people to be corrupt. So this is a situation. Now, when you hear Africa corrupt, Africa corrupt, and the people don't follow how corruption came to Africa. In my view, corruption has been brought to Africa by the people from outside the continent of Africa. I don't like it. I don't like it. And I'm not here to recommend the corruption. I'm just saying that it should not be said it's an African. It's an African thing. This thing called the corruption came to Africa from elsewhere. How do you deal with corruption in your country? The corruption in my country, 
we have a setup mechanism. An anti-corruption commission is in existence. And they have all the power to investigate the reports concerning corruption without any interference of the government. At any level? At any level, of course. At any level, including the president, if they found that the president is, uh, 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 is doing corruption, they have uh, the power, those who are in the anti-corruption commission. And given you have all these foreign contracts with foreign companies involved in the mining and all your resources, they are looking at the foreigners as well as the Namibians, I guess. What do you mean? Foreigners who might be paying bribes to get a contract, for example. Well, like I said, corruption by and large has been imported in Africa by some people. And I think some of the foreign companies who are coming there, they have a tendency of bribing, in other words, corrupting those who are in the offices. Have you managed to catch any of them? Well, we are trying to catch some of them. We did catch some of them. Can I move to the future, sir, Get of your country yes. and what happens next? You have had two terms now as the president. Where is the next generation? Well, as I said, and I will keep saying so, we are a country guided by the, the rule of law and uh, the constitution is the supreme law of the country. A president elected democratically is allowed to serve maximum 10 years. Five years first, and then election takes place again. If the people feel that he should continue, they elect him. And even if the people would feel like electing him after the second term, the Constitution does not allow that. But, so, you, but you could, after someone else took over from you, come back the next time around. When you finish this term, is it the end for you, sir? Uh, it's the end, absolutely, it's the end. It's sure. the end. Uh, we, we, we don't have a long history. Uh, say, for example, my predecessor is not expected to come back. And I would not be expected to come back after I have finished my second term. Both of you, the, the, the first two presidents of Namibia, are from the generation that fought the liberation struggle exactly. in your country. Exactly. Do you think it is a challenge for a new generation taking over who don't have that experience? And do you think this is a, will become a difficult election, a difficult point in the country's history? The last 22 years, what we have been doing, we have been bringing into the leadership the young people in order for them to take over. As we are getting out, we have some young people who would take over. If you look at our parliament, you'll find young people. If you look in the government, within the cabinet as well, you have the young people. These are the people we are promoting to take over. After our terms uh, expire, do you so think it will be another leader from SWAPO? Because one party, I know it's the people who've chosen one party, one party has led this country all the time since independence. Is that a healthy thing? Well, I think it depends on the people. If the people feel that, they have to elect a SWAPO to power for the next 20 years. It is, this is what a democracy means. As long as the leadership of SWAPO is not imposing itself on the people, but they are being elected by the people, the people who elect the SWAPO, I see nothing wrong in that. And it's in line with the democracy that we have set for ourselves. President Pohamba of Namibia, 
thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. I thank you very much for talking to you as a representative Al Jazeera. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.